Hi, Porik here. Well, thank you for all your great questions and what a beautiful day it is outside for a little bit of gardening. I mentioned a couple of plants with Jonathan this morning, so I'll just run through them and just show you some of the plants we chatted about. We, I spoke about this lovely dahlia. Um, this is a one called Happy Days. It's a pink variety of dahlia. Very, very easy to grow. Beautiful bronze foliage, nice pink flowers. This particular variety, because it's a single flowering dahlia, is perfect for pollinators, so attracting bumblebees and honeybees into your garden. So it's a really nice variety. And also because it's single flowering, it tends to flower for a longer period. You tend to get more flowers and it tends to carry on late into the autumn, early winter sort of period. So I would expect this plant to be still in flower in October of this year. Lovely in a pot or container, or indeed you can plant it out into the garden soil. Another plant I mentioned were the petunias. So this is one called Pepe Blue, but they come in pepper purple and pepper pink as well. Nice dwarf variety, lovely for a patio pot or container. And again, it will flower from June through till October. Liquid feeds are about every fortnight with a tomato feed and it's it's a great plant for showing colour. This one here is called Biden's Be Alive. So again, if you want a plant that's going to bring bees into your garden, but also give you lots of colour right through the summer, then that's a really nice plant. So it's Biden's, B-I-D-E-N-S, Be Alive, a really super plant for pots, containers, or again, you can plant it out into the garden soil. And finally, we chatted about the diacea. This again is a lovely trailing plant. So if you've got a rockery or maybe a raised wall and you want something to cascade over it, then diaceas are absolutely lovely and they come in a whole range of different colours. But there's lots of really good plants. This is a picture of the hydrangea that I mentioned with Jonathan. So this is one called Hydrangea Runaway Bride. It's a beautiful new variety. It's in flower at the moment and will continue to flower right through until the end of the summer. It actually flowers on new growth. So as it makes new growth during the summer, it's producing new flowers continuously. It starts a lovely shade of white and then changes to a blush pink. So it's Hydrangea Runaway Bride, a really, really nice new introduction, a new plant. Doesn't grow too big, roughly about maybe three feet in height, by about four feet in diameter, so it's broader than it is tall and gives stunning colour right throughout the summer. So we've got lots of questions in, so we'll go to them. Okay, so our first question is, can I grow basil directly from seed outdoor in an ant hotel? Okay, that's interesting. Now, the the variety of basil I, I mentioned, I brought into studio to Jonathan, he's actually gone home with it, is a variety called, it's a Greek basil called uh, Aristotle after the Greek philosopher. So it's different to the Italian. It's a small leaved basil, very, very easy to grow and very hardy. The seeds of basil are generally sown indoors. So I would sow them indoors inside in a, in the, on a windowsill would be ideal. Cover them with a little bit of cling film once they're sown and they'll germinate within about two weeks. Take the cling film off and let them grow on indoors for a couple of weeks. Get them nice and strong and then put them outside into your patio pot or container. So don't sow the seeds directly out into the garden soil because the slugs will get them and they'll be very slow to germinate and any so cold sort of temperatures will put the plant back. So start the seeds off inside side. June is still a good time to sow the seeds of basil, as it is for many plants. It's actually an ideal time for sowing the seeds of many vegetables and flowering plants, and the temperatures are perfect at the moment. So use your windowsill inside, sow the seeds, cover with cling film, and you'll have basil in at least a month's time. They'll be ready for planting out. This next question comes from Attracta. I have a beautiful lily in my garden, but the snails and slugs are devouring it. What can I do? Okay, so the good old slugs and snails. And slugs and snails, particularly when we get cold temperatures and wet weather, they become very active in the garden and they will destroy lilies, hostas, many of your bedding plants as well. I would use the organic pellets. So you can get a pellet called Eraza, E-R-A-Z-A, or there's one called um, Neerdorf, and they're both organic. They've got the organic symbol on them. They're blue in colour, same as the traditional slug pellet, but they don't affect um, birds or dogs or children if they eat them. They're very safe to use, but are very f- effective at controlling your slugs and snail. So I try to put a small amount of the Eraser slug pellet around the base of your lily, repeat it maybe in a fortnight's time, and that'll control any slugs and snails. The other thing you find very beneficial is garlic wonder. So it's a, a spray of garlic that you can mix in a washing can or sprayer. And if you put that on the foliage of your lilies or on hostas, again, the slugs dislike the taste of garlic and they'll move on to something else. So give that a go. Cleona is trying to encourage a lemon tree to produce more fruit. Any tips? 
Well, the, the key thing with lemon trees, the, the citrus plants, anything in the citrus soil, lemons, oranges, kumquats, they need to be indoors at this time of year. Um, so a bright, sunny location, a conservatory, a patio door, somewhere is getting pretty warm temperatures. That'll help to initiate flowers and if you regular feed with a high t- potash feed, so something like a tomato feed or Osmo Universal feed, that will help to keep the plants flowering longer, setting fruit, and it'll help to develop the fruit on them. So regular feeding with a tomato feed, generally every fortnight for lemon trees. Water them again about once a fortnight. But the important thing is to move them into a bright, sunny location. Make sure they're growing well, and that'll help to induce new flowers, and hence you'll get more fruit off the plants as well. So bright location, regular feeding with the tomato feed and your lemon should produce nice fruit for you. It does take nearly a year for the fruit to form so once the flowers are pollinated from the small embryo fruit to a ripened yellow lemon it'll take nearly a year so be patient. So Hazel asks pruning roses, when do I do it and how do I prune them? Okay. So Hazel, generally the pruning of roses is done any time from November right through till March. So I normally will cut my roses back in November, just shorten them back roughly by half. And then in March, I'll give them a further pruning, go back to within six or eight inches of ground level. Now, this time of year, roses, of course, are in flower. And we do a a small bit of pruning called deadheading. So that's taking off the old flower of the rose and taking about four or five inches of stem when you deadhead. So go further back on the stem once the flower starts to fade and prune it back four inches below the flower. Give it a feed, use some of the rose rescue or rose clear on the plant to keep the bugs off it and that plant will come back into flower again within about six weeks. So regular deadheading which is a form of pruning during the summer months and we continue to do that right up to September and then the normal pruning back is done any time from November right through to March. So any severe pruning leave it to the winter or spring of next year. Howdy. I really don't like using pesticides and I do my best to avoid them. Do you know any good websites or resources for good natural remedies for things like green fly and ants? That comes from Paddy. Howdy, Paddy. Well, a great question. And, and the use of pesticides, um, it's, it's very important that when you're using or if you are using any pesticides, you use them as little as possible, possible and follow the directions very carefully. Now, there are some treatments like, for example, bug clear which is normally used on fruit and vegetables, Paddy, and that is made actually from oilseed rape. So it's a very safe, organic way of controlling aphids, green fly, black fly, white fly and caterpillars. So that's very safe to use. You can actually use the bug clear today and you can eat your crop tomorrow. So you just leave a day um, of an interval harvest between spraying and actual eating. So look for that one, bug clear. I often find the garlic wonder very good as well. So it's made from garlic. You can make it yourself if you want by just boiling up a couple of garlic bulbs, boil them up, let them cool, use that liquid then in water to put on your hostas or on your vegetables and that will keep slugs and snails off but also it will deter aphids and green fly. Um, So there's lots of, I suppose, organic based Uh, or natural remedies that you can use rather than the harmful pesticides. So for me, I use the bug clear quite a a bit on my plants because it's safe. And I also use the garlic wonder. You can buy it as a concentrate in your local garden centre or you can make your own up paddy by simply boiling up three or four uh, bulbs of garlic. Just boil them up um, and it produces a syrup and you add water to that and apply it onto the foliage. You can also get netting like um, EnviroMesh netting which slips over your plants so For example, if you're growing cabbages or cauliflower or Brussels sprouts, you slip the netting over the plant and things like the white butterfly cannot get into the, physically can't get at your cabbage plants and to affect them. So there are physical barriers that can be used as well, particularly in your fruit and veg garden. So Anna Lee is wondering, is there an increase in spittle bug this year or cuckoo spit and is it damaging to plants? Well, cuckoo spit is, it's it's very well described because it's like a spit that, that, forms on the um, stem of plants. Now, to be honest, I've seen very little of it this year. You normally will get a certain amount on plants. Things like gooseberries often have it. Even weeds are attacked by the cuckoo spit. So it's a small caterpillar that forms and, and, and basically creates this spit around itself to protect it from predators like birds that will actually normally eat it. Um, so I haven't seen much of it this year. But having said that, if you do need to get rid of it, my advice is to slightly spray the plants with water that removes the cu- cuckoo spit from the actual pest 
test itself. And then you can apply something like the bug clear that I mentioned already, which is safe uh, and it's a very good natural treatment for the likes of the the uh, cuckoo spit caterpillar. So if you need to remove it, slightly water the plants, remove the spit, then apply the bug clear and that will control it. But, but to be honest, I have seen very, very little uh, cuckoo spit this year and it does very little damage. It's only if you have a severe infestation of it that you might need to treat it. So most plants, just leave them well enough alone. The caterpillar will pupate and, and leave the plant within a couple of weeks. So it's nothing really to worry about. Phil asks, should I use chicken poultry pellets on fruit and what's the best feed for rhubarb? Okay. Hi Phil, well rhubarb is a hungry feeder so remember that you're removing the leaves and the stems when you're harvesting rhubarb so it, do, it does lead to lots of energy. On my rhubarb patch in the autumn and early winter I apply a heavy dressing of organic matter so either compost that I've made myself from the grass clippings or something like horse, horse manure um, or any form of, of organic matter is very good mushroom compost applied in the winter once the rhubarb is dying back and you allow that to decay into the soil and the rhubarb pushes itself up through it then in early spring. At this time of year to give it a boost I would put on something like the Osmo Pro 6 which is a granulated fertiliser. It's a little bit stronger than chicken manure and again you can apply it say today the rain and the dew at night time will wash it in and the rhubarb will respond to that by producing new growth. So Osmo Pro 6 it's a very good natural granulated fertiliser, ideal for all fruiting plants and also it can be used on trees and shrubs as well and this sort of weather is an ideal time to get it on. Typical rhubarb plant you'd put on about two to three handfuls around the base of the plant and that'll boost it on for you. Anna's wondering is there any natural products I can use to prevent bugs from eating strawberries? Okay, so back to the natural treatments. Well, remember, the, the main bugs that affect strawberries are aphids, first of all. Green fly, in particular, will attack the stems of the strawberry plants. And slugs and snails, of course, love the strawberries once they start to ripen. So for me, to control aphids and green fly, first of all, check the plants. If they're not there, there's no need to spray and just leave them well enough alone. For the slugs, definitely put on the organic treatment, the... Um, eraser that I mentioned or the Neerdorf pellets. They're both organic, they're safe. They're blue in colour like a traditional slug pellet but they're very safe for birds, children and uh, pets and uh, they're, they're actually made from iron and phosphates. They control slugs but they don't affect us. They're an, actually a natural fertiliser. So once the pe pellet disintegrates it actually goes back as a fertiliser into the, the soil. So I would apply um, the uh, sl slight dressing of the eraser, slug pellets. The other thing with strawberries at this time of year is to put a, a layer of straw in under the fruit. That helps to keep lift the fruit off the ground, so it helps to deter the slugs and snails from getting at it. And also it helps to keep your fruit nice and dry and they won't rot as quickly. And for the aphids, I wouldn't spray unless you see them physically there and they'll be quite visible at this time of year. And if they're there, then you can use the natural bug clear treatment, which again is safe to use on strawberries. Watch the birds as well, I should say. The birds will, will feed on your strawberries as well. And if you need to protect against birds, you can get an anti-bird netting that will just fit over the strawberry plants and keep the birds at bay as well. Deirdre's son wants to take an established rose from a garden. What should he do? Okay. Great question, Deirdre. Well, this time of year in June, it's a really good time for taking the cuttings of plants. So taking short cuttings, roughly about six, maybe eight inches in length, um, and roses are perfect to take cuttings from this time of year. So you're looking for ideally a shoot that hasn't any flower buds or, or flowers on it. So new growth, roughly eight inches long, about pencil thickness. Remove any uh, leaves from the plant. So you're looking to produce a naked stem like a pencil and leave one or two leaves right at the top of the rose. Dip that into rooting powder and put it into a small pot of vermiculite or perlite mixed with compost. So mix the two together 50-50. Nice gritty mix. In a standard small pot you'll fit about 8 or 10 cuttings. So you can pop them in together, have the compost moist but not too wet and cover with a polythene bag. Something like a butcher's bag that we buy meat in over the top of the pot. Sit that on your windowsill and within 3-4 to four weeks the rose cutting will actually have rooted and you've got yourself a new plant. So from the plant itself, take about six or eight cuttings. If there are any flowers on the shoots, remove the flowers, remove the flower buds, strip down the leaves, 
dip it into rooting powder, into a pot of 50% perlite and compost and cover the polythene bag and you're good to go. You get yourself some new rose plants by July, August of this year. They can be planted out then in the garden and they'll come into flower this time next year for you. And remember, this is a really good time in June to take cuttings of many plants, geraniums, fuchsias, uh, philadelphus, lots of plants propagate buddleias very well from cuttings taken at this time of year. Six to eight inches long, rooting powder, and away you go. So Sean had a successful foxglove from seed. Will they reappear next year? Sean, foxgloves are short-lived um, perennials, which means that they will come back next year, but they tend to die out after a couple of years. So if you get two to three years from your foxglove plants, you're doing really well. Now, a couple of tips to keep them living longer. If after the foxglove goes out of flower, they're flowering beautifully at the moment, but you will see they're starting to produce their seed. So once the flowers are beginning to fade, in a week, maybe a fortnight's time, cut them back to r- roughly half. So remove the flowering stems completely from the plant, give it a liquid feed. They'll often come back into flower again, Sean, so it's well worth doing it. But you're also putting all the energy into building up the plant rather than the production of foxglove seeds because once it produces its seed it's done its job and they often die out so stop it from producing its seeds give it a couple of liquid feeds that'll bulk it up and it'll come back next year again for you and this is the time of year actually to sow the seeds for loop for foxgloves and lupins and many of the cottage garden plants if you sow the seeds now in june on a warm windowsill you've got new plants for next year you can plant them out in your garden in july and august and they'll give you beautiful flowers this time next year So Harry has our final question today. What's the best organic spray I can use for my roses to get rid of black fly? Okay, Harry, well, again, like I mentioned, if you want a good organic spray, for me, the Bug Clear is very safe to use. It's made from rapeseed oil, so it's a natural product. It's a natural derivative from rapeseed oil. Basically what it does, it coats the aphids in the oil and they smother and it kills them off that way. So use that, um, the, the bug clear. I would mix a little bit of the garlic wonder liquid in with the mix. So you can mix the two together quite safely. And the garlic wonder gives a beautiful, rich colour to roses. So many of the growers, the Irish growers that grow roses commercially, will use garlic wonder as a drench and as a spray to build strength into the plants first and foremost. Many pests dislike the smell of garlic, so that wards off any pests. But also it brings a beautiful sheen to the roses and that helps to protect against any diseases like black spot and mildew. So get yourself a small tub of Bug Clear. Make sure it's the one for fruit and veg and also get a small container of Garlic Wonder. Mix the two together, apply it on your roses every fortnight and you'll have trouble-free roses in full flower for the rest of the summer right until next autumn. Remember, my, my name is Pori Corkin. You can get more information on our website, horkins.ie. And I'm back here in Wednesday, two weeks, to do it all again. Bye for now.